Hi everyone, hey, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so grateful for this opportunity that we have to connect this way. And I'm just, I'm just honored that you would connect today. And thanks for, thanks for watching. Hey, I wanna just encourage you, if you didn't get to watch last week's message, I hope that you'll go back on the YouTube channel or on my Facebook page or Hillside's Facebook page and see last week's message as well. We're in just a little mini series here on the topic of worry. Um, I have been carrying a three-part series in my, on my phone for literally years, and I have listened to it several times, dozens of times probably, and you may say, wow, dozens, you're kind of a slow learner, and that is true, but, but it's also just these messages aren't complicated, but they certainly are helpful and practical, and I seem to learn, pick up a little something every time I, I listen to them, and I know they're going to be a help and a blessing to you as we talk about this subject of worry. You know, worry is really, what, the preoccupation of the future, um, but yet the future is so unpredictable that, you know, overthinking the future can, you know, really drive you nuts. Um, I was looking up the etymology of the word worry, and the etymology goes back to an old English word that means to strangle. And I think most of us would say, well, you know, when we're feeling worries of life, that we certainly feel like that that's happening, you know. Um, my daughter posted something really funny, and you may have seen it, but she says, you know, uh, with regard to this whole year, you know, we're not that far into it, but man, way too much has already happened. And she says, you know, I want to cancel my subscription to 2021. I, um, I've used up the seven you know, days of free trial, and uh, I am not interested. <laughs> and you may feel that way already. You know, we were kind of hesitant as we got, went into 2021, realizing, wow, we're probably going to take a lot of the junk from 2020 into, a, into this new year. And wow, we had no idea, right, all the craziness that would happen in such a short time. But I want to encourage you that even though we may have worries, and, and by the way, worry isn't just saying, okay, I don't care. I'm, you know, forget it. I'm not going to do anything, you know, shirk my responsibilities. That's not, that's not, you know, being worry-free. Um, that's being careless. But there are some attitudes, there are some help that we can see from teaching of Jesus about what to do with circumstances that would otherwise be very worrisome. You know, I mean, I think we could rightfully say we're probably in some worrisome times, right? We've got, you know, the economy and they got all the political difficulties going on. We've got a pandemic going on. I mean, it's, it's a worrisome time. And yet Jesus gives us some really great guidelines as to what to do with our worries. And so I'm really looking forward to sharing this message with you. It's got a funny little teaser at the beginning that we're going to really relate to. Even though this was recorded some years ago, uh, it's way too appropriate for us now. This message today, part two in our series of Why Worry called Switching Sides. Uh, hey, is this your uh, wallet in the bathroom? I won't even ask you to raise your hand if you've slid out through the bathroom door without touching anything. It's just, just kind of that thing we do. Hey, we're talking about worry, and uh, worry is universal. Everybody worries, and there's been worrying for, for forever and ever and ever, and uh, it, worry goes all the way back to Jesus' time, and one time when Jesus had a little extra time to talk about whatever he wanted to talk about, Jesus talked about worry, and so the encouraging thing is it's not just you, and it's not, not just Americans. People have been worrying for at least 2,000 years because 2,000 years ago, Jesus looked out at his audience, and he went, boy, they 
they look worried. This, this looks like a good sermon topic. And so uh, there, there's amazing things written about worry. If you're a worrier, you should go online. You should buy a book. There's all kinds of stuff to help you worry. And, and worry is essentially a preoccupation with tomorrow. That's what worry is. Worry is, you know, I'm okay right this minute, but it's those next, it's those future minutes that I'm not so sure about. Worry is a preoccupation with somehow wanting to control tomorrow or find certainty in tomorrow. And you don't really generally worry about right this minute. You, it's, isn't it true? You, you're worrying about the next minutes. It's all about the future. And, and as we said last week, the truth is you've never at any point in your life, in any category of your life, been able to control the future. There's never been any absolute certainty about the future, but it just at different times in our life and different arenas of life, we're reminded of how uncertain things are and that's when we worry and worry is about in this moment worrying about the next moments and somehow trying to, to, to capture you know the attention of God or somehow being able to harness some power to where there's certainty about tomorrow one, one article I read as much as I could about the, the subject coming into the series and one thing I read one author wasn't a Christian author just a secular author said that worrying is like prayer in reverse Worrying is like prayer in reverse, and I love that because it's true. Prayer generally makes issues smaller. Worrying generally makes issues bigger because when we worry, what have we done? We've sort of cleared out all the other arenas and all the other issues of life, and we have focused our attention on one thing. You know, Am I gonna get into that school? Am I gonna pass the bar? Am I gonna pass an exam? Is she gonna call me back? Are they gonna keep me in the company? Is our industry gonna survive the recession? You know, We get hyper-focused on the one thing, and it gets bigger, 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 bigger bigger, bigger. And you know, we're just totally distracted by something we can't really, in most cases, do anything about. So Jesus, knowing all this 2,000 years ago, it's as if he wrote this for us in our modern day, addresses the issue of worry. And the thing that he does, which is so helpful, unlike anything else I've read, Jesus actually gives us a solution. And all the other things basically help you medicate your worry or help you, you know, deal with your worry or cope with your worry. Honestly, Jesus comes along and says, actually, there's a solution for this. And this sets him apart from everything else. So I think you should read everything you can about worry and find books and it help you with your stress and anxiety and you know, go see a doctor. I mean, all that's you know, fine. But Jesus, I mean, what he says is absolutely incredible. So I didn't want to rush through it last week, so we split it in half. And so we, if you have your Bibles and want to follow along, we're in Matthew chapter 6. And I kind of gave you half a sermon last week and some things to think about. And today we get to the conclusion of what Jesus says about worry. But if you weren't here, I want to make three quick statements to kind of catch you up with what we talked about last week. Jesus made three amazing points in the passages we talked, the verses we looked at last week. The first one was this. He said, first of all, this is where we're going to start today. He said, first of all, you can't add anything to your life by worrying. No matter how good of a worry you are, you might be like a professional worrier. People may come over and say, help me. You know, I'm not as good as you. Help me. You might be like your, your husband or wife may say, you know, you worry about everything. You worry about things that aren't even related to you. You may, like, may be like the greatest, you know, worrier in the world. But Jesus said, but you've never added anything to your life by worrying. You've never been able to harness the future or reach into the future and manipulate the future by your worrying, you're not able to add even one minute or one second or one hour to your life by worrying. You're not able to impact the things that are most important to you. So basically it's a waste of time, which means it's a waste of life because your time equals your life. When you run out of time, you run out of life. So when you say it's a waste of time, it's a waste of life. So Jesus says, first of all, even if you don't believe there's a solution, we can all agree on this. It's a waste of time and life. The other thing he says is this from last week. He said, by saying don't worry, I'm not saying don't care. Now, some, one of the pushbacks that you're gonna have today or maybe you had last week is when I read the verses where Jesus says don't worry, you interpret that as Jesus saying, well, don't care. In other words, I have a big test. Jesus says don't worry, so I'm not gonna study because Jesus said don't worry, so I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm not gonna care about it. You know, your marriage is in crisis. Your wife says we need to go see a counselor. Yeah, but Andy said, and Jesus says don't worry. So I'm not gonna worry about our marriage. It'll just all work out. That's not what Jesus is teaching. In fact, you read the life of Jesus, you never find a shred of irresponsibility. You never find a shred of Jesus saying, well, it'll just work out, who cares? So saying don't worry is not the same as saying who cares. In fact, last week we saw Jesus taught the opposite. He said, God expects us to do all we can do, but once we've done all we can do, we don't need to worry about the next series of moments. 
that Jesus taught that we're to do all we can do in the now. Have you filled out the application? Have you studied? Did you show up for the interview? Did you pay all the bills that you could pay? Have you done everything you can do? He says, you do all, is there a sign in the yard? You know, you do all that you can do. And once you've done all you can do, you don't have to worry about the next series of moments or days or hours because your heavenly father cares for you. So he's not advocating irresponsibility. So don't worry doesn't mean you get a latte, a surfboard, and just chill and hang out. That's not what don't worry doesn't mean. It means that you don't have to have a pile of anxiety over something you have no control over, which is the future. Because as Jesus said last week, we have the opportunity to be in communication with and relationship with the only one who knows and can manipulate and control the future. And then the last thing, and this is where he's going to take us today, and this is, this is such a big thought. Jesus taught that the things that you're most devoted to are the things you worry about the most. That if you want to know what you're really most devoted to, track your worries, because your worries lead you to the point of your greatest devotion. That your devotion impacts your emotion. That's what we worry about. And so one of the best questions that we can ask as we think about the things that we worry about is this. If the things I worry about reflect my devotions, what am I most devoted to? And that's where Jesus kind of picks up the thought and takes us to a solution. Because if what we're devoted to determines what we're worried about, then if we could redirect our devotion, we would conquer, in many cases, our incessant need, our feeling like we need to worry about the future. So we're going to pick up in verse 27. I'm going to read three verses that we covered last week just to kind of get us going. And then we're going to jump into the second part of this passage. If you weren't here last week, I highly encourage you to listen to last week's message online. You can go online and watch it for free, listen to it for free. You can get a CD. There's all kinds of ways to find it. But make sure you get both sides of this. And then next week, next week, as we close the series... We're going to look at a story from the Old Testament that's a fascinating story of someone who, in a very dramatic way, bumped into some of these same truths. All right, so we're going to start in verse 27. We covered these last week. I'll just read through, and then we'll pick it up where we go. Matthew 6, 27. Can any of you, and here's the big question, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? No. And he could have said, how many of you have worried so much you've taken hours off of your life? And we would all raise our hand. And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin like we do. We labor and we spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. And remember last week, Jesus says, I want you to pause and take a little lesson from nature. Remember he said, look at the birds of the air. And we said, we don't have time for that. Look at the flowers of the field. We do not have time to look at the flowers of the field. I got to pay my mortgage and, you know, work on my 401k. If I can find it, you know, we have all that stuff to do. And Jesus says, no, wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm trying to help you. So just back up a little bit, and I want you to consider, I want you to consider what I have done, have been doing, and what you have taught your children that I've done, and grew up believing that I did. I created everything. Don't you believe that? We, yeah, yeah, yeah. I created economy, uh, I guess, you know. I created the flowers, the field, and the birds of the air, and they have instinct, they fly south, and they come back, and, you know, flowers break through the soil, and there's the circle of life, and, you know, Lion King, and there's all this stuff that I put into motion, I put into motion, and you believe that, don't you? Yeah, in the beginning, God, yeah, I believe all that. I believe there's a creator. I taught my children that. We looked at the flannel graph and did vacation Bible school, and Noah's ark, you know. Yeah, I, I believe that God's behind all of that. He's going, okay, okay, okay. Don't lose sight of those things that you believed as a child and that you believed your whole life because this is part of helping you overcome your worry. So he says, verse 30, talking about the flowers of the field. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Again, taking us back. Do you think God's God? Yeah, you think God's in control? Yeah, you think God started this whole thing? Yeah, you think God's behind it and keeps the planets? And, yeah, yeah I, I believe there's a power. I, I believe all that. He's going, okay, okay, okay. If, you, if you're that far along in your faith, why would you stop short of the next step? And then this is where he kind of twists the knife a little bit. And we, this is where we ended last week. Oh, you of little, what's the word? Faith. In other words, this is, this is huge. Even if you just stop here and don't listen to anything else. There is a relationship between the size of your faith and the size of your worry. He says the reason your worries are so big is because your faith is so little. In fact, this is really fascinating. I didn't tell you this last week. 
the little, there's two little Greek words that are combined together, kind of a, a compound word, um, or a compound word, is that what you call it? Compound word, yeah, thanks, English teachers. Compound word, that this is really fascinating. This word doesn't show up anywhere in any other Greek literature, older or newer than Jesus. This word doesn't show up anywhere else in the New Testament. Jesus made this word up. He's the only one that took these two words that don't go together and fit them together. Where it says, oh, you have little faith. Literally, I think he was making fun of them and kind of had a smile on his faith. Here's what it would mean literally in this environment. He said, oh, you little faithers, you. It's a word he made up. You're a little faither. Little, little faither, little faither, little faither. He says, come on. You're, but I think he's poking fun at him. He's going, okay, get me straight. Let me get this straight. You believe God created everything? I believe. You believe the birds figured the whole thing out because God put it in them? Okay, yeah, I don't, yeah, I believe. You believe the flowers come up and they die and they replenish and they seed and the bees and the holy, yeah, I believe all that. You think God did all that? Yeah. So you don't think God can clothe you? Well, Oh, you little faither, little faither. You're a little faither. I think he's just making fun of him. He's going, look, you've already, you've already believed the harder to believe part. Why don't you just let your faith go the next step and say, you know what? I don't know how it's going to work out. I can't control the future. I've spun and I've sowed and I've reaped and I've saved and I've done all I know to do and I've paid my bills and I've worked hard and I've, I've studied hard and I filled out the applications and I showed up at the interview. I've done, I've done everything I know to do. I can trust God with the next series of nows. I can trust God with tomorrow. He's going, come on. The reason you're so worried is your faith is so small. You little faither. You, because there's a relationship between your faith and your worry. People with huge faith, they don't worry much. In fact, they bother you. They have the same set of circumstances you do, and they're not worried. And you're like, come on, you need to join the worry club. The rest of us are worried. You need to worry. What's wrong with you? And some of you have had the privilege of interfacing with or having friends with or living close to people or going to church with people who really... They don't worry. In fact, their circumstances are worth, worse. Their future is darker. Their future is far more unsure. And you talk to them and they've done all they can do, but they don't seem to worry. They don't even seem to be afraid. And you think what I think when you meet those people, you think, well, I don't know how I'd handle that. Well, I'm glad that's not me. Boy, if that happened to me, I'd be a nervous wreck. If it happened to me, I would drink more, I'd medicate more, I, I, my family would probably blow up. I don't know how I would get out of bed in the morning if I was going through all that. And they just, they just seem to be not fine, but they're just not worried. What is that? You've just met somebody with big faith. Because the bigger your faith, the smaller your worry. So Jesus says, okay, come on. We need to talk about faith here. You see, you don't stop worrying by trying to stop worrying. It's like trying to go to sleep, but trying to go to sleep, right? Remember when you were a kid and your parents were saying, no, just try to go to sleep. You know, how do you try to go to sleep? I don't know how you do that. Same thing. You know, you don't, you know, if your husband or wife or your kids say, mom, you worry too much. Stop worrying. Okay, I'm going to, how do you do that? Jesus says, okay, I'm going to tell you how, but we got to see this connection. Part of the problem is, and if you don't understand the problem, you'll never embrace the solution. It's a faith problem. Your faith is small. You've not allowed your faith to go the next step. You've not even followed your faith to its logical conclusions. God did all of this. Do I think God can handle this? He moves on. O oh, you of little faith. So, verse 31, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Now, as we said last week, the what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear, those were the worry points of the people in his culture. They are not the worry points for most of us. That's not what most of us are worried about. We're worried about some things that could lead to the place where we would say, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, and what, where shall we live, and what shall we wear? But the people, for people in his culture, it was day to day, it was hand to mouth. If Jesus were speaking today, he may say something like this. He'd say, so don't worry saying, where am I gonna find a job in this economy? How am I gonna sell my house in this economy? How am I gonna pay for my kid's college? How am I gonna apply for the scholarship? How am I gonna get into that school? How am I gonna get into that fraternity? How am I, how am I? He says, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, don't worry saying, woe is me. How's it gonna happen? How can I ensure a future for myself? How can I control the outcome of these decisions? How can I somehow harness you know, God's power to make something happen? He says, Look, don't spend your time stressed out all over, over those things. Now, listen carefully. Not because they're not important. They're very important. Not because you should be careless and not care. Not, the, not his point at all. He says, don't worry about those things. After you've done all you can do, don't sit around worrying about the future. And then 
he really kind of twists the knife. Again, he's just playing with us, kind of playing with his audience. Listen to what he says next, verse 32. Still hasn't given us a solution, verse 32. For the pagans, now this is Jesus' word, not mine, okay? So the pagans, that's people who don't even believe there is a God. Don't believe there's a personal God. Don't believe that God knows your name. Don't believe there's a God that answers prayer. For the pagans run after all of these things. Now, this is a real important little phrase. When he says, for the pagans run after, that's parallel with worry, that's parallel with seek, that's parallel to devote themselves to. He's gonna look, he's gonna look, 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 look. come on, come on. You guys believe there's a God, yeah, we believe there's a God. You believe God did all this stuff, yeah, we believe, and, you know, we would say, and we believe God sent Jesus, you know, we're, we're there. He's gonna look. If you're so stressed out over these important things, these critical things, these things that are important to life, if you are so stressed out and bent out of shape over all these things that you can't get to anything else and you're so distracted, you're acting like people who don't even believe there is a God. You're living your life practically as an atheist. You're saying, yeah, I believe, I believe, I believe, but that's irrelevant. I've got to worry. I've got to stress out. I've got to over-medicate. I've got, you know, I've got to take the edge off. I am so, he said, if you do that, you're acting like a person who doesn't even believe there is a God. Now, Here's where I think that little phrase is so important to us right now, where we are as a culture and in our nation. Now listen, you see, all of us to some extent are arm in arm with people who have the same worry and the same needs and the same concerns about their industry, about real estate, about jobs, about school, about future, about marriage, I mean, you name it. There's a group you could have huddle up. We could divide up this room and say, everybody whose number one concern is, what am I gonna do with my house? You go right over there. Everybody whose number one concern is that prodigal son or daughter that you can't seem to act right, you go right over there. We could all huddle up and be you know, arm in arm. We all have the same worries and concerns. And Jesus is saying this, look, as you bump into, share your story with, and rub shoulders with people in the marketplace who have the same worries that you do, your response should be so different that they are amazed. In other words, they should be able to look at your life and say, wow, but you don't seem worried. I mean, you seem to care. I mean, you seem to be a responsible person, but aren't you worried? Aren't you afraid? How do you sleep at night? Aren't you freaked out? How, what are you gonna do? Why don't you seem to be, you know, out of, out of control as my other friends who have the same issues? Jesus says, this is your opportunity to shine brighter than ever before. You know what, I think as a church, as a culture, as Christians, this is our opportunity. Because we're at a place, as a, and as a nation, we're at a place as a people where there is more to worry about than there ever has been before, or at least that's the perception. Which means for those of us who face those same circumstances but refuse to be bound by worry, our light and your light's gonna shine a little brighter. And Jesus is saying, look, if you give in to worry and you get sucked into worry and you get distracted by your worry, there might as well not even be a God for you. You're acting like everybody else. Here is your opportunity to shine brighter than ever before. Now, you know what you're thinking. You're going, okay, is there another opportunity to shine brighter than before? I'd like to have another opportunity, okay? If we could just let this one move on and give me another one, like how to manage wealth. You know, he, he won the lottery. And you know all those other people, when they won the lottery, it ruined their life, but it didn't ruin his life. He, I'd, I'd like to shine like that. Could I sign up for the win the lottery, shine bright, you know? But we don't get a choice, do we? We don't get a choice. And Jesus says, look, your struggles and your temptations and you know, your circumstances are common to all men. The difference is not the challenge. The difference is not, the difference is not the trial. The difference could potentially be your response. Don't worry, run after, fret, and get bent out of shape over, you know, where am I gonna live and what am I gonna eat and what am I gonna wear? He says, that's what people who don't think there's a heavenly father worry about. You should be different. Still, he hasn't given us an answer. But listen to how he finishes out that thought. And your heavenly, end of verse 32, and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Now, this is what separates the pagans from the unpagans, this right here. He says, come on, don't you believe or do you believe that your heavenly father knows that you need these things? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that your heavenly father knows that you need these things? Wouldn't it make a huge difference if you were just to live your life as if you really believed and knew 
that your heavenly father knew, uh, imagine it this way. Imagine if tonight, you know, you got all this stress and it's a kid thing, a marriage thing, a money thing, whatever it is, business thing, industry thing. What if tonight, just before you went to sleep in some way that didn't totally freak you out, an angel appeared and all the angels said, and you knew this angel was from God. I know this is kind of weird. And the angel said, God knows. He knows. That's all he said. That's all the angel said. He knows. Would that be like extraordinarily comforting? If you just knew for certain that God knows, even if nothing changes, even if you don't know what God's gonna do, even if you have no idea about tomorrow, isn't there extraordinary comfort in the fact that he knows? Because if he knows, and he's kind of worried about it, if he knows and he's on it, then I don't have to really be as worried. And Jesus says, okay, by the way, in case you weren't, haven't been paying attention, he knows that you need these things, which means they are important. This isn't about it doesn't matter. It does matter. But the good news is your heavenly father knows. And because he knows, you don't have to worry. But you're only not gonna worry if you believe that he knows and you trust that he knows. And that's why the bigger your faith, the smaller your worry. But if you could come to the conclusion, you know what? I really believe that God knows what I need. And God knows about my loneliness. And God knows about the stress. And God knows about the marriage. And God knows about the house. And God knows about my industry. And God knows about the clothing, cl the, the closing and the clothing. The God, if I really was confident that God knew all of that, what would happen to my stress level? What would happen to my worry level? And Jesus says, I know what would happen. It would decrease significantly. And so he says, your father knows what you, that you know, he knows that you need them. And now, drum roll, he comes to the solution. I mean, he's made fun of us. He says, you're not as smart as a bird. You don't have as much faith as a flower. You know, you're as bad as the pagans. You don't have any faith. You're a bunch of little faithers. I mean, he's basically made us all feel like total weasels. And he said, now, now, there is something you can do about worry other than trying not to worry. I'm gonna tell you what it is. And it goes back to this idea that he introduced at the beginning of the passage when he said, you can't serve God in stuff. The issue is your devotion. He says, the solution to worry is redirecting your devotion. The solution to worry is not try to stop worrying and the solution to worry isn't, well, it doesn't matter anyway who needs a house and who needs to eat and maybe, you know, that's not the solution. The solution is to redirect your devotion. Listen to how he opens the statement that gives us the solution. You've heard this a thousand times. You may have sung it in songs all your life. Here's how he begins. Verse 33, but seek, what's the next word? Let's pause right there. But, big contrast to all that we've said so far, but seek first. In other words, what you have been seeking first is the wrong thing. What you have been extraordinarily devoted to is leading you to the valley of worry. What you have been seeking first is why you are where you are emotionally. You've been devoted to the wrong thing and where you are is the result of being devoted to or seeking first the wrong thing. He says, so I wanna give you the solution. The solution is a transfer of devotion. The solution is to channel your devotion to something entirely different than where it's been before because your devotion determines where your emotions are and your emotions determine what you worry about. And here it is, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. But seek first, as opposed to school and grades and job and house and prodigal son and daughter and kids and singleness and loneliness. He said, all those things are very important. In fact, your father knows all about them. But as long as they are your primary devotion, as long as your primary devotion is financial security, as long as your primary devotion is happy marriage, as long as your primary devotion is kids that act responsibly and get a job and get out of the house, and as long as your primary devotion is all of those things, getting in the right school and fraternity and the GPA, and grad, as long as those are your primary devotion, then you're just gonna worry. But I wanna invite you into a whole different way of living and thinking. This is Jesus' invitation. This is Jesus' invitation for every one of us to surrender our entire lives to him. Not a segment, not just the area you're worried about. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want there to be a reversal in your devotion. I want you to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, which means I want you to seek my agenda for the world and to put your agenda second. 
Now, many of you, especially if you're raised in a Catholic church or in a Catholic system or went to Catholic school, you know all about this because you quoted this a thousand times. If you're raised like me in the Baptist church, you only heard this mostly at weddings and it was sung and it was this lady went like really high and it shaked the chandelier. But in both cases, you've either said it so many times you've forgotten what it means or you heard it sung so many times you didn't pay any attention. But here's what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's not complicated. It's not theological. Jesus summed it up this way when he prayed the prayer we've all memorized. Ready? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That means in your life, in your dirt, in your world, in your earth, in your marriage, your business, your finances, your school, your parenting, your kid raising, all that stuff. Thy kingdom come, this is what he told us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To accept Jesus' challenge of seek first the kingdom of God, it simply means this. It means you pray like this, God, you know how bad we need to sell our house? Apparently all of our neighbors are in a similar situation because there's signs everywhere. Now we've added things, you know, first and it was discounted, then it's got a pool, then it's got a basement, then it has a yard, we planted an oak tree, now the signs are trailing along the ground of all the things, why? And then we started putting them on the top and it's been discounted and discounted again and you can get an interview with the president and just, just come, please come by, somebody come see our house, you know? And so you're stuck and I'm making light, it's very, very serious for you. And you say, God, we gotta sell our house. And God, I, we haven't, I don't know how it's going to happen. But God, thy will be done. Because I've made a decision. Your kingdom comes before mine. <sighs> to trust you. God, you know how bad I want to get into that school. And I've done everything I know to do. And my temptation is just to obsess over, is it going to happen? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? But I've decided, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth, in my earth, on my dirt, in my life, as it is in heaven. I've decided to seek your kingdom first and where I go to school second. I've decided to seek your kingdom first and my business and my industry second. I've decided to seek your kingdom first and address my singleness second. I've decided to address, in other words, I've made a transfer of devotion Instead of being committed to my kingdom and trying to get you to answer my prayers, I'm gonna take Jesus up on this challenge. I'm to the best of my ability gonna surrender all of my life and say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No matter what happens at the end of every prayer, at the end of every day, when I'm so tempted to delve into tomorrow and worry about tomorrow, I'm gonna say, wait, you know what I need. I believe that. You know what I want, I've told you that. But at the end of the day, I sincerely, to the best of my ability, I want your will to be done in my life more than I want my way. And when you make that transfer of devotion, something happens to your worry. I've seen it a thousand times. Sometimes people are forced there through brokenness they're, everything is so taken away and life is so shattered and life is so unpredictable, they feel, like they, have no, they feel like they have no option at all except to say, God, I surrender everything to you. And God's going, well, you didn't leave me with much. You waited a little long, but hey, okay, I'll take it. You know, I just surrender all my life to you. And, and they will tell you, and you've been there at different times in your life, and suddenly there is a peace, and the Bible says it this way, that surpasses human comprehension, which means it's a peace that doesn't make any sense because nothing's changed except something in your heart. And Jesus Jesus says, look, I know you're freaked out and I know you're worried. You're wondering where the next meal's coming from. You wonder what you're gonna wear, what your kids are gonna wear and where you're gonna eat and sleep. And I'm telling you, you, get, you don't stop worrying by trying to stop worrying. You stop worrying by exchanging devotions, by becoming devoted to something entirely different than you and your kingdom. And so he says to his audience and to us, so I'm inviting you, I'm inviting you. Would you begin, would you make the decision to open up your hands and say, I'm surrendering everything, my good marriage, my bad marriage, my finances, my 401k, I'm, I'm surrendering everything to you. At the end of every prayer, after you know what I think I need, thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done. I'm trusting you for tomorrow as if I had any option anyway. I'm trusting you for tomorrow and I'm praying that you would be glorified and that your kingdom would be glorified and you would shine brighter and people would know you better because of what happens in my circumstances. That's what I want more than I want anything else. You say, well, Andy, that scares me to death. Well, there's another option. Just worry. Just worry. Well, God, Andy, if I, if I open up my hands and... Offer God everything. What if he takes it? What do you think's happening right this minute? What do you, that's why you're so worried because you can't control it anyway. Okay, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't care how good your job is. You have no idea what tomorrow holds. None. Oh yeah, I got a day timer and a day planner and four assistants and a calendar and a, oh, you may not even make it to work. You have no certainty about tomorrow. So why would we worry about it? You go, I don't know, I know it doesn't make any sense, but Jesus says, I'm just, I'm just inviting you. I'm inviting you, I'm inviting you to say, in every area of my life, thy will be done on earth, here, as it is in heaven. And then, here's the surprise ending. End of verse 33. And all these things, what things? All the things you've been worried about. All the things you're concerned about. All the things you don't have any control over. All the things you don't know how they're going to work out. And all these things will be given to you as well. They will? Really? Yeah, because you're more important to God than a bird. And you're more important to God than a flower. And you've been invited to address him and call him your heavenly father. So of course, he's going to take care of you. And then he closes, verse 34. Therefore, summary statement, wrapping it up, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In other words, when your mind begins to wrap its emotion and its tentacles and its concern about tomorrow, he says, no, 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 that's, that's, that's just when you stop and you say, no, thy will be done tomorrow. Thy will be done tomorrow. Thy will be done tomorrow. I've done all I can do in the now. I've done all I can do in the today. Thy will be done tomorrow. I fully trust you with my tomorrow as I have sought to seek your kingdom first today. When I was preparing, I just, I read all the stuff I could on worry, and I read an article by a secular psychologist, and it was an interesting article on meditation and how to relax your mind and your brain and your feet and your toes and your eyes and, you know, all, and it's, it's all good. It's all, meditation's good. It's great. But the funny thing was at the end of this, at the end of this really sort of, um, not medical, but a kind of high, high-end kind of article about meditation and, and relaxation, he tells a story. And the story so parallels stories I've heard all my life in ministry, but it was like this unique little, huh, kind of story to this guy. And the story was about a friend of his whose seven-year-old daughter was killed in an automobile accident. The guy totally freaked out. He started drinking. He drank his way out of a job, drank his way out of a marriage, just drank his, drank his way into a hole, just could not deal with the stress and the unpredictability of life. And eventually checked himself into a rehab place that was built around the AA model. And so the guy was in there for several weeks, when he came out, his friend who wrote this article was talking to him and was, he said, I was surprised by the sense of peace that he had, not only just in terms of alcohol, but just life. He had no job. He had left a trail of destruction behind him financially in other way, any, every other way. And he asked him, he says in this article, he said, I asked him, I said, how are you, how are you coping with the uncertainty? Because everything in this guy's life was uncertain. Here's what he said. He said, I'm hanging on to something I learned in AA. The guy said, what's that? He said, one day at a time. One day at a time. And the guy wrote this article, of PhD, whatever. And you know, I think that's really good advice. I'm going, yeah, it's like 2,000 years old. You know, your friend didn't discover this. And AA knows they didn't discover this. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, said, I got an idea. Why don't you worry about today and let me worry about Tomorrow, in other words, why don't you decide to just take this one day at a time? Not because of a sense of fate and whatever happens, happens. No, we're not trusting in fate. We're trusting in God who's invited us to call him Father. 
And Jesus says, I'm giving you permission. I'm giving you permission not to obsess over tomorrow because I will be in your tomorrow. You just be responsible today. And then at the end of this day, you say, but thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in my world, in my circumstances, as it is in heaven. And I'm not gonna worry, not because I don't care, not because I'm not responsible, but because I can't control the future and I'm trusting you to be there. And as my trust gets bigger, my faith and my worries get smaller. So here's what I would suggest that you do between now and next week when we wrap up this series. And um, I, this is a version of something that many people have done for many years and I've seen this done in lots of different ways. I thought about wrapping up the service and having us do this together, but I think this is a bigger deal than a quick commitment. Okay, Andy, you know, I'll pray, Lord, I'm not gonna worry anymore and you can be in control. I mean, you know, we're sincere when we make those decisions, but as soon as we walk out these doors, nothing has changed, right? Nothing has changed. Here's what I would suggest you do. Would you be willing this week at some point to get alone when you've got a few minutes, and this may be five minutes, this may be 30 minutes, and would you be willing to make a list of all the arenas and areas of your life, not just the ones you worry about, but everything. Start with the ones you worry about. Job, industry, next week's closing, kids' school, tuition, am I gonna have to pull my kids out of private school? You know, what about keeping my son in college? You know, what, what all, here's, here's basically everything, that, here's every arena of my life, my marriage, my husband's job, whatever it might be. You just make a list because this is life to you. This is that part in the, in, in, where Jesus would say, is life not more than, and then you'd fill in the blank, is life not more than a job? Well, yeah, is life not more than clothing? Yeah, is life not more than where your kids go to school? Well, yeah, I guess life's bigger than that. Just make a list of all those things. Here's every arena of life. Here are the areas where I tend to worry. Here's just, here's basically, here's my whole life. If you were to say, tell me about your life, here's every category right there. It's, it may be a word, it may be a sentence, it's whatever you wanna do. And then, I want you to read this passage. Then I just want you to pray and say, God, I know what happens when I hold this like this. I worry because I, I want somehow for there to be the certainty and, and the future the way I imagine it. But God, I know where that's gotten me. I know where that's pulling me. I know what that's done to my relationships, my thinking, my health. And so, I just wanna say, I'm changing devotions. I'm redirecting my primary devotion away from all this. This is still matters, this is still important, I still care. But I wanna learn what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So, I'm letting you have this. You're gonna be more important to me than all of this. I'm releasing this, I'm saying, thy will be done. You know what I want, you know my hopes and dreams and my goals and I got a plan and I got an agenda and I got sub point A and three because I'm organized or I just have a general idea. Thy will be done. I'm devoting my life to you above my devotion to all these things. That's just called surrender. And this passage is simply an invitation what we say in lots of different ways on lots of different weeks. Would you be willing to surrender your life, what represents your life, to your Father in heaven? And when you do, that will be a step of faith. And I'm telling you, that's where the action is. It's one thing to believe that. It's another thing to trust in. Believe that is I believe that the Bible is written by God or I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that we should go to church. I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. That's fine and good. The action is, the transition happens, the change takes place when you move from I believe that to I trust in. And when you say, God, I'm shifting my devotion from me and my kingdom to you and yours. And I'm surrendering and I'm trusting you with what defines life for me. That's a trust in, not a believe that. And something will begin to happen inside of your heart. Jesus says, you conquer worry not by trying to conquer worry. You conquer worry by surrendering your life to God's agenda for your life. You don't conquer worry by trying to conquer worry. You conquer worry by surrendering your life to God's agenda for your life.
you end every day and every prayer with, but thy kingdom come and thy will be done on this earth in my life as it is in heaven. And then you cannot worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will take care of itself. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, that's so much easier for me to say than for any of us to do. And Lord, I know that outside the walls of this building, there are bills, there are unanswered prayers, there are pressures, there are expectations. There are people that are demanding things of us. There's insecurity, there's marriage things. There, there, it's just all out there waiting for us. And Father, you know, and I pray that we would leave here at least with the assurance, God in heaven knows and can be trusted. Father, however this lands in each of our lives, would you give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard? And would you give us the courage to do it? And for some of us, I pray this would be a breakthrough week as we maybe for the first time in our lives open our hands and say, I'm surrendering my life. I'm surrendering everything that, that represents life to me. I'm surrendering it to my heavenly father. Thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Father, please bring us to that point. And Lord, I, I pray for the person that's listening that has just excruciatingly difficult circumstances. Would you please in your grace and your mercy, would you respond in some tangible way that it would go beyond you simply knowing that they would see you do something in their life as an indicator that yes, you know and you do care for them. And I pray all of these things, Father, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, you may not have grown up in church, but uh, maybe you've heard it before, but maybe you did grow up in church and you heard that, what we call the Lord's Prayer, and that part where Jesus said, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it sounds a little ethereal. It sounds a little bit, uh, you know, ideological instead of really practical. But think about it. Jesus is king where we allow him to rule, right? I mean, something is ruling your life. Something is the boss. Something is the, is the king of your life. It might be a thing. It might be a job. It might be a relationship. It might be you. It might be a person. But something is king. And, and this prayer it is really practical for us that we can say, God, I want you to be the king of my life. And I want your will to be done in my life and through my life. And that's something we can invite God to do just by inviting him. He makes this available to all of us. He makes eternal life. He makes the very fact of us being a part of his family available to anyone who will ask him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever ex exercises that trust and that faith in him will be saved. Most weeks I have a prayer that we we pray along you know and it's varied um there's no magical prayer in receiving that gift of eternal life that god offers but today because andy talked about devotion and you know what we seek first we can seek ourselves first we can seek our you know careers first or whatever but you know when we seek god first i'll tell you so many of our worries just vanish because he's carrying the weight of them and if you would like to accept christ today as your savior as your king, the king of your life, I want to invite you to do that. As I've done in weeks past, I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm just going to invite you to pray along with me and I'm going to display it here on the screen and you can follow along. And I hope that you'll pray with me if you haven't already. If you've prayed this before and maybe you're not sure you, you really meant it, <laughs> you know, you could pray along again. If you have prayed this and you're already a Christian and you say, hey, I already know, pray for those who may be praying this for the very first time, would you? And um, I invite you to pray along with me. Dear God, today I want to shift from relying on myself to relying on you. I have been devoted to a lot of things, but today I give you my life. Thank you for sending your son to be born, to live, to die on the cross, and rise again for me. Replace my guilt with your forgiveness and replace my worries with your peace. Please replace my uncertainty about the future and death 
with your gift of eternal life. I accept your gift of salvation today. Please be the king of my life and may your will be done in my life like it is in heaven. Today, the best I know how, I trust you and put my faith in you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that today, I'd love to know about that. I want to be of any encouragement and help I can be in your spiritual life. And um, and maybe you weren't ready to pray that prayer. I, I'm glad to be of any help I can. Just message me, private message me, and just say, Hey, David, I'd kind of like some material. I'd like, kind of like maybe send me some links to things I can read or whatever. I would be glad to be of any help. Uh, if you'd like to just talk. I mean, we can talk on the phone or we can text or whatever you feel comfortable doing. I'm, I'm so happy to be of any help I can. But again, I just want to say again, a great big thank you to all of you for joining me today. Um, if you're part of the Hillside family or plan to be eventually, I, uh, I want you to know I'm just hoping and praying that we can soon all be together again. I know it's a crazy time, and um, it's, a, it's as I mentioned, it's going to be a worrisome time. But uh, I want you to know, God is still with us. God is strong. He is our confidence. We can place our trust in Him, and we can give Him our worries. Hey, I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week. I hope you'll plan to connect with me again as we have the third and final message in our series, Why Worry? I look forward to seeing you. God bless.